Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Nathan and I are delighted to welcome back Lee Brainerd to our program. Many of you are familiar with Lee from his past appearances with us and his insightful books delving into God's Word. Lee is a self-taught expert on ancient languages, including Greek and Hebrew, and yet he has the ability to convey incredible insight in a way that is clear and concise. Lee, I'm just so grateful for you to be with us here today. Thanks for coming back to Christ in Prophecy. Well, amen, Tim, and it's always a pleasure to be here with you and Nathan and the whole uh, Lamb and Lion crew. Well, we're glad you're here. Well, folks, uh, Lee is one of my favorite authors. Not only does he write fiction as related to Bible prophecy, like the Planet Shaken series, but he gets really deep into certain biblical studies like yes. the apostia, and uh, he really knows his languages. But his newest book is what we're going to be talking about today, The New Heavens and Earth. And uh, Lee, if we go to Revelation 21, 1, it reads, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. And it's a similar passage to Isaiah 65, 17, yeah. which talks about uh, at some point the Lord is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. But the question Christians often have is, does that mean a renovation of the existing heavens and earth? Or is He going to obliterate it all and create a brand new heavens and earth? And that's what your book addresses, correct? At Absolutely, yes. Okay. It's been a, a thought that's uh, been an exercise of mine for quite a number of years to, to approach this subject with actually going broader and deeper in the scriptures than men usually do. Well, yeah. I mean, I've never heard of a, someone writing a book about just this topic. Usually it's a reference or maybe a page or mm -hmm. two, but you have an entire book and I just got to say it's very well organized and you have a tremendous amount of evidence. Which side did you take, renovation or recreation? I took the renovation side decisively. Okay. You yeah. know, I found a lot of great quotes in your book. I'll, I'll open just the very preface and you say as the opening words, a quote from Proverbs 18:17, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor examines him. And you really challenged me to think about what positions I hold perhaps that I've just kind of adapted or adopted from the, the world around me or even from other Christian friends, but I've never gone to the Word of God. And we always challenge our viewers, right. our readers, to challenge everything we say against the Word of God. So you dive deep into the Word of God and not just in our English translations, but in some of the original transcripts to come up with these points that you make throughout your book. Yes, yes. Well, it's always been my ambition since I was a young believer to make sure that I gather whatever I'm going to embrace and teach from a Berean perspective, mm -hmm. that we want to actually examine not only to see if what the Apostle Paul taught was true, but the, the teachers of our day. There's mm -hmm. always a a temptation for us to do a little shortcut and probably lean on our favorite teachers more than we ought to. They're there for a reason, but they're not there to tell us what to believe. They're there to sharpen us. Mm. Why Good do you point. think the tr church is traditionally held to a recreation idea? This idea that, okay, we get to the end of the millennial kingdom, then Jesus holds the great white throne judgment, and then everything that he ever created is eradicated, and then he creates everything ex nihilo, so to speak, out yeah. of nothingness, kind of like going back to the creation again. And you read a lot of, and you cite in your book quite a number of major Bible prophecy teachers that yeah. hold that view. Why do you think that's so popular? Well, I think the underlying idea is they look out there and they see a pollution problem in the universe. And we, we, we feel it. This universe is polluted. It's defiled. And there has to be a solution to this. And somewhere along the line, the idea that God's perfect solution is to annihilate the universe and start over has come into their mind. But as we're going to see uh, in, in my book, we point out, or I point out that God's solution that he uses is not annihilation, but he loves to fix everything that can be fixed, clean everything that can be cleaned, sequester what can only be sequestered. You know, I always go to the passage in Revelation 21, verse 5. It's my favorite scene from Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, although it's not accurate within yeah, yeah. that setting, where Jesus says then, Behold, I make all things new. And he says that in Revelation 21, 5. And I always thought, wow, he's going to make everything new. And that may have leaned me toward an expectation that he's going to obliterate that, which yep. is old and polluted, kind of like tearing down an old house. 
It's always easiest to build from, uh, from scratch as opposed to renovate an old house. And yet the Lord in His miraculous power renovates us. When I put my That's faith right. in Him, He didn't say, all right, Tim, boom, you're, you're gone. I'll create a new Tim that now is, has a clean heart. No, He cleansed me yeah. and, and all of us who put our faith in Him. And so I'll use another analogy that you made in your book. You said you're going to take a deep dive. And, and we encourage people, even in our Lamplighter magazine, to yes. dig deep into the Word of God. So explain to us, as you took this deep dive, what you found in some of those ancient uh, texts of Scripture that points to the idea that the Lord's not going to just obliterate everything, but He's going to restore uh, through His miraculous cleansing and healing power. Well, I, for instance, you'll find in uh, the 104th Psalm that there's a pro that the heavens that we see are eternal. And we see in Deuteronomy chapter 4, the heavens that we see are eternal. And I believe there's a reference in Ecclesiastes, I think it's 4.1, hmm. for the land, um, and I have it written here, yeah, Ecclesiastes 1.4, that the uh, generations are going to change but the earth is not going to change. The, the earth remains forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so there's a number of references of this kind in the Old Testament. And we could cover the kingdom, we could cover the Temple Mount, we could cover the Jerusalem. There's promises that they are all eternal. Right. You have different chapters that talk about the eternality verses. Yeah. Uh, you apply them to heavens. Uh, the Bible teaches that the heavens are eternal, yep. that the earth, this earth is eternal, that the land of Israel is eternal, that Mount Zion, Jerusalem, David's throne, the eternal kingdom, and all of these things, whenever it's prophesied, uh, I particularly love the Davidic kingdom passages where yep. it say that, that Jesus Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem on this earth forever and ever. Yes. Now, if God destroys everything and rebuilds it from fresh, is that negate that, or does he have to be on this this physical earth that exists forever and ever? And, and uh, that's that is one of my very favorite arguments myself because okay. when the Lord has promised the land of Israel and the Mount Zion and the Temple to Israel, he's not promising a, from a similar piece of dirt on a similar planet in a similar solar system in a similar galaxy in a similar creation. He has owned that exact piece of dirt for mm. eternity. So if we go to Jerusalem today, that Jerusalem will be here a thousand, ten thousand, a million, a billion years in the future. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, I, we recently did a Jesus in the Old Testament series yeah. and have been going through that for some time. When we were in Ezekiel, we talked about in chapter 36 that the Lord tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the mountains of Israel, these inanimate yes. objects, yes. making promises to the mountains. That's right. And so he fulfills his promises to us. He's going to fulfill his promises even to those mountain ranges that are there today in Israel. Absolutely. And you know, there's an interesting thought that a lot of people don't take into consideration. This planet is actually, in a sense, you could say sacred, even though it's defiled. This planet was walked by hundreds of prophets. There's blood of hundreds of prophets here. This soil was walked on by the Lord Jesus Christ. His tears were mixed with the dirt of this earth. His blood was mixed with the dirt of this earth. Um, the, the, there's a whole history of God's involvement with this planet. And when He put Adam and Eve in the garden, if there hadn't have been a fall, God and Adam and Eve and their people would have walked together on this planet in this creation for eternity. And the plan of redemption isn't just the redemption of the human race. It's a redemption of God's entire program with His creation. Hmm. You know, uh, what blew my mind when I was reading your book, and this is the first I'd ever considered it, is that we know that when Jesus Christ returns, this yes. earth is going to be devastated. 21 judgments of God are going to devastate That's the right. earth, and the tribulation time period will leave the earth a wasteland. So we know that when Jesus comes back, you know, people say, well, how are we going to live in a millennial kingdom if the earth is a nuclear wasteland? No, when Jesus returns, He renovates the world and, and builds it to the garden paradise it's supposed to be. And then, well, Satan's released at the end of the millennial kingdom. Yep. He causes destruction, and well, then the Lord just annihilates everything and rebuilds it. And that was kind of the, what I've been working off based on the chronology of Revelation. But you say that the Lord's, the only renovation is actually the renovation at the second coming, which puts it a thousand years earlier than most scholars would put it. Why is that? Well, I believe that what the Lord is doing during the thousand years is that He's got, we have the last dispensation of salvation overlapped with the beginning of the eternal kingdom. 
And the reason for this is, of course, we know that every dispensation elevates man's, uh, the light that he's given and his privileges, but it also elevates his responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So when we were in the, the Mosaic dispensation, there was the Shekinah glory presence of the Lord in the temple, and he was uh, present in a lesser degree speaking through his prophets. We come to the new covenant era, we have the Shekinah glory dwelling in every believer, and that's amazing in and of itself. When we come to the millennial kingdom, we have the Lord Jesus Christ present here on earth with kingdom blessings, the blessings of eternity. So when we go through the kingdom, what a proof of depravity that we have, because here's people with perfect government, perfect economic opportunity, perfect climate, perfect education, everything is perfect, perfect society, and yet men still rebel against God. Mm. So when you, when you give them the blessings of eternity in the presence of God manifest in the flesh and they still rebel, that is the definitive proof of man's depravity. The prophecy about the new heavens and the new earth is one of the most breathtaking prophecies in the entire Bible. It is also the title of Lee Brainerd's newest book, The New Heavens and Earth, Recreation or Renovation? Order your copy today to learn about that glorious day when the widespread effect of the fall and curse will finally be undone and mankind will at last dwell in God's restored creation. But how will this new creation and earth come about? Will the current heavens and earth cease to exist and be replaced by a second ex nihilo creation as many Bible teachers insist? Or will the current earth be refurbished by earthquakes and fire from heaven even as the last earth was refurbished by the flood? In this volume, Lee Brainer presents several arguments based on historic precedent, the character of God, the eternality of the earth, and the eternal nature of the kingdom established at the second coming. Lee combines these to make a formidable case that the new heavens and earth will be the current heavens and earth refurbished. The new heavens and earth book is available for a donation of $15 or more, and that includes the cost of shipping. Just call the number you see on the screen or order online from our website today. You know, I think the Lord proved his ability to address not only spiritual pollution yes. and corruption, but physical corruption. Absolutely. Uh, he did that dramatically when he told a young man, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees said, hey, what power do you have to forgive sins? He said, well, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your bed and walk? And so he demonstrated powerfully that Amen. he has the power in both regards. And so I, I accept, obviously, that all of us who have put our faith in him are new right. creatures, new creations. I've been given a new heart. I still have uh, aspects of my, my natural self that yep. uh, he is continuing to eradicate and to purify. Someday we'll be glorified, both our bodies, minds, souls, uh, every aspect. Yep. But the idea that he's going to also purify and cleanse this planet, I, I think I do agree there has to be some purification yes. before we go into that millennial kingdom. Otherwise, yep. what a mess it would be. That's right. And yet, what about this rebellion at the end of the thousand years? What mm -hmm. damage will it do? Will there need to be another dose of, of uh, purification or cleansing at that point? Yeah, help me understand that, because that's the part I'm trying to understand yeah, with your theory. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. We do read that there will be a rebellion. There's going to be these people gathering around the New Jerusalem, and fire's going to fall from heaven and consume them. So that problem is also fixed by fire. Now, whether that fire uh, ends up being broader than just consuming those gathered around there. Um, the scriptures doesn't really say. So we couldn't say positively or definitively mm. there isn't anything beyond that because this might be representative of, of, a, of a bigger issue that's being dealt with, but it might also be really the summation of the whole thing. And I haven't really dived into that book, and I wouldn't uh, fault a brother which way they went on right. this issue. Um, but clearly, God's pattern for dealing with sin uh, at the beginning of the kingdom was with fire. And that's the same thing he uses at the end of the thousand years. So does he have to fix up the earth at the end of the millennium, just like he did at the end of the tribulation? I'm going to, my gut sense as I deal with the passages on the subject is the rebellion at the end is very limited. Just outside of Jerusalem. Yeah, because what we have is we've got the kingdom of God controlling the, the entire, entire earth. Globe. So yeah. instead of the earth being controlled by the devil and defiled by the devil, the devil's let out for a little while. And the way I picture what's happening here, this isn't 
going back to what we know in this world now where the devil's got control of the entire world. That's He's true. got control of, I would guess, uh, 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 whether it's uh, 50% of the world or 60% or 10%, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, we're probably going to be very much speculative there if we try and even guess. But some worthwhile, worthy segment of the world is going to follow him in his rebellion. And I think this is going to be less of the, the world rebellion that we're familiar with and more like a gigantic protest. And the Lord is going to deal with it. And so there's no worldwide destruction that he needs to refurbish. He just needs to clean up this area and then we move on into the eternal Right, because this, this is a rebellion, like a protest. Almost what you would call an insurrection. Huh? Yes, yeah. against the established yeah. government. I don't think it's going to be allowed to defile the entire world. They're going to come and lodge their protest. So we, we can, I agree with you, it would yes. be speculative to determine yeah. how many people, what percentage, what, what role they play. We know that Jesus Christ eradicates those who That's are in right. rebellion against Him. But the, the point is that whenever it occurs, and, and I do think that you have a great point, if we're going to live on a, an earth that is restored to absolute uh, perfection like it was yep. in the beginning, everything is good. The, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom yep. is restored. It is, is relieved from the curse of sin. Then much of that renovation has to happen at That's the right. beginning of the millennial kingdom in order for the people who live on this earth under the administration of believers in their glorified bodies, the earth has to be restored. And yeah, Jesus yeah. has... We see examples of this. You know, Jesus cleansed the temple, but the temple was cleansed at other times, even though it had been defiled. I use the example of a, a, a Antiochus Epiphanes who came in and tried to slaughter a pig. Well, they went through a rededication ceremony right. to sanctify the, the temple. In that case, Jerusalem will be re-sanctified, and of course, all of us. Yep. The Dead Sea itself will be restored right. when the stream of water flows from the throne of of Christ there on Mount Zion. Over I and love over that again. fishing story. Yeah, yeah, you love that fishing story. We see that the power of God to restore is true every time a person puts their faith in Christ. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the principle for restoring human beings, the principle for restoring the Temple Mount, the principle for restoring creation, very similar. Fantastic. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and let's go into the eternal state. Okay. A lot of, I think, you know, there's two chapters, Revelation 21 and 22 that most people point to is yep. what life will be like in the eternal state. Since you've researched so much about the new heavens, new earth, I'm excited. Tell us what will life be, not just after, after the millennial kingdom. Now we yep. are, what will we be doing in the eternal state? What is life like? Um, well, I think for the believer, for the Christian believer. And that's all who And that's the only yeah. people in the yeah. eternal state, That's right, right, right. yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, I was thinking in a technical sense, the re redeemed Gentiles of the Christian age are, are distinct from the redeemed of Israel, but we're all under Christ. We're all believers under the Messiah. We're all in the one big family of God. But anyway, going down that path, um, we're going to have job obligations during the kingdom doing kingdom work. But once we come out the other side of the kingdom, I like to say we have two obligations for eternity, formal worship and informal worship. Formal worship will be our regular times of gathering around the throne of the Lord as kings and priests worshiping the Lord. But informal worship, we're going to be going about indulging all that God has given us in creation, enjoying being a human being, and we're going to have spontaneous worship coming out of our heart day after day. And it won't matter if we're into art or music or we're a motorhead or we're a geologist. It won't matter what we are. We will never uncover the last cool thing in creation and we're going to say, wow. And I think we also, we can't imagine. I mean, there's yeah. a song, I can only imagine what yeah. it will be like. And, and sometimes I realize that my imagination fails me. I, I, I remind myself of my six-year-old birthday party. Yeah. The only one I can really remember from my childhood. But it was the anticipation I remember. The night before, I knew my parents were creating party favors and, and little uh, decorations and a cake. And just my mind ran wild with how wonderful that party was going to be at six years old. I am sure the party was not as grand, in spite of my parents' efforts, yeah. as my anticipation made it out to be. That's right. And yet it's exactly the opposite for us as Christians. No matter how much I can anticipate and speculate, heaven's going to be even greater. The eternal state that That's we right. are with Christ is going to be even better. And yet I think there's one aspect sometimes we miss. And, and we had recently Johnny Erickson Tata yes. on our program. 
and what a joy she was, just overflowing with hope and joy. And I, I have a quote I, I want to share with you yes. because people would tell her, and she cites, they often ask, well, you must be looking forward to heaven, thinking she's finally going to get out of the wheelchair. And she said, I am looking forward to heaven after more than 25 years in a wheelchair. It's true that I am. But more than that, I am looking forward not just to my new body, but I'm looking forward to a heart without sin Amen. and being able to see God and worship Him with Amen. a clean heart. Amen. And boy, what a, what a statement of joy and hope that is because, yes, all the wonderful things about the world, but for us to be able to be in the presence of our Lord Amen. and have a, a truly clean heart, no stain of sin, no even pull or temptation towards sin, what a joy that will be. That's why we were created. We were created to worship the Lord, to have Amen. fellowship exactly. with Him. Exactly. It's like, you know, we, we talk a lot about how disconnected, you know, where is God? And when we pray, we sometimes feel like we're praying to the air, but that's because our sin is, is blocking us from Him. But one day we'll stand with Him face to face. In the millennial kingdom, yeah. we'll see Jesus, but in the eternal state where God's omnipresent, He's everywhere, He's always with us, and we have that perfect relationship. I, I think that's what really defines eternity. Amen. I mean, you read about the New Jerusalem, and it's filled with all this uh, pure gold and all these jewels and, and materialism, and that's, that's fine. That's kind of from a secular mindset. Yes. Like Islam, you know, that's paradise. But the real treasure of heaven is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're Absolutely. not suggesting yeah. that uh, our sins are still weighting us down. We are forgiven. Yes. But yet, Paul said, we see through a glass dimly. That's because exactly we are right. trapped in this particular world and body, yeah. we are not yet seeing yeah. face to face as we will in yeah. our glorified state. And a lot of my ministry, I tend to, to point out that there's gifts involved and not just a giver in eternity. But the truth is, and this is the point you, got, you gentlemen have been making, you take the giver out of the picture, this will not be heaven to have all those cool gifts without the giver. Mm -hmm. It would be empty. Yeah, I mean, that's wow. the Islamic view of paradise, that, yep. that Allah is not even there. You're there with your 72 virgins and enjoying a sensual eternity, and Allah is not there. And the Bible says, no, that's not what eternity is about. It's not about yourself yep. and filling your lusts. It's about having that perfect relationship with your Creator yep. again. Well, we've, we've talked about what we'll be doing in the eternal state, and we a little bit about the new Jerusalem, the super city, and new earth. But you also talk about the new heavens. And that, yeah. I think, is confusing for a lot of people. What does it mean, the new heavens? Are there many heavens? Is there one heaven? Will we be in heaven? What is that? Well, obviously, we, we, in the scripture, we read about three heavens. There's the, the heavens that the birds fly in and the clouds float in. There's the heavens that involves all the heavenly bodies that we see. The third heaven is the New Jerusalem. And that's where Paul went when he said he went up to the third heaven. But when we're talking about the new heavens, I believe this is talking really in reference to all the stars, the planets, the constellations, everything that we see. Well, how is there going to be a new heavens? Are they going to cease to exist and then there's a new heavens up there? And is that new heavens going to bear an analogy to the one that we see right now? Or is it going to be completely different? Well, I think really what it comes down to is at the second coming, uh, the new heavens and the new earth is something that man can see with his eyes. And I suspect what we're going to have is that the globe is going to roll. And when it rolls, it'll be a polar shift. This is going to take Arctic climates more temperate. It's going to take Antarctica into a temperate climate. It's going to be involved in making this globe inhabitable to more people. Like Genesis again. Yes. Okay. And then on top of that, if, you, if this globe is rolling, uh, not fast enough to knock a man down, but fast enough that change happens pretty quick, a man would watch the stars come up on this horizon and roll, the stars would be rolling across the sky mm. like words on a scroll and then dropping on the other side. And I think they're just describing an event that they see happen. And it will give them so a new star chart. They'll see a different heavens at night when they look up in the heavens. So our compass will be pointing south instead of north. Or something of that nature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I think about heaven and, and all the things that we can imagine, yeah. uh, going back to my six-year-old mind, I, I cannot imagine. And so... You know, I oftentimes go back to Ezekiel in the wisdom that he shared. Lee, you bring yeah. much wisdom with your understanding of ancient languages yep. and ancient texts. But the Lord asked Ezekiel if he could possibly comprehend these dry bones coming to life. Yeah. And the physical, the natural mind would say no. But Ezekiel was much wiser than me because his response was, Oh, Lord, you know. Absolutely. And so many things I, I leave over to the Lord's understanding. I love to grapple and speculate yep. on what is to come. 
The, the promise is that we are redeemed, that we will be glorified, right. not by any worth in ourselves, but by the power of God Amen. and the restorative power of Jesus Christ, and that He will make all things new. Amen. And so we can only imagine how great and glorious that's going to be. But the last word in your book was, and I don't want to give away the conclusion, but it's just beautiful. If we embrace what is presented to us in the Bible, we will see that redeemed man will live on a redeemed planet and a redeemed universe with the Redeemer God. That's the, the key mm -hmm. for all of eternity. And human beings that cannot cease to exist shall inherit an earth that cannot cease to exist and a universe that cannot cease to exist. What a great God and Savior is ours, Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Lee, I tell you what, we are so delighted every time you come. Uh, what's your next book project you're working on right now? I'm doing a, a, um, a updated version of the pre-wrath rapture answered. I've had several different ministries say you have to update that book, get up to speed. So hopefully by the grace of God, I'll have that done this year. And you do promise you're going to conclude this series. Oh, right? I want to know how it turns out. Yep. Well, how can our viewers get in touch with you and your ministry? And of course, we're going to make your book available here on Christ in Prophecy. So if you are interested in getting a copy of Lee's book, The New Heavens and Earth, you can get a copy through his ministry or through us. We will be glad to ship you a copy for $15, including shipping and handling. But Lee, how can they get in touch with you and your ministry and follow all the things that you're doing? If they're interested in buying my books, they can find me on YouTube. Just just uh, put my name, uh, not YouTube, I mean Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> um, you can find, just look for Lee Brainerd, Lee W. Brainerd, and it'll bring up my books. But you can find my ministry on YouTube at Soothkeep, S-O-O-T-H-K-E-E-P, Old English for Truth Fortress, and my website, soothkeep.info. Thanks, Lee. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Until next week, Nathan and I say, look up and be watchful, for our Lord, who has promised to make all things new, is drawing near. Hello, my name is Nathan Jones, Internet Evangelist here at Lamb and Lion Ministries. We're using the Internet to proclaim the soon return of Jesus Christ to the billions of people who are connected online now and after the rapture. I would like to invite you to come and check out our website at ChristinProphecy.org. Watch whole episodes of Christ in Prophecy and our short prophetic perspectives and the Inbox series for in-depth teaching about end time events. Read from the library of articles on our website and blog covering all aspects of God's prophetic word. Subscribe to our free e-newsletter to receive the Lamplighter magazine, as well as to our social media to stay up to date on current events as they relate to Bible prophecy. Equip yourself to share the good news with others using materials from our online store. I invite you to come and visit ChristinProphecy.org today.